Hello, thank you all for uh, being here today. I'm uh, very happy to have the honor of introducing Victoria Chavez today. She was one of the first people I met at Davis and in the last year I was lucky to be able to get to know her, um, especially over the course of long Amtrak rides from the Bay Area where we were both commuting from. Uh, in fact, I partially credit her with helping me get through the challenges of the program. In the words of an influential Italian philosopher, there can be a hundred people in the room and 99 can tell you no, but all it takes is one person to believe in you. I feel as though in our cohort, uh, Victoria has been one of these bright, optimistic and supportive people. Victoria is originally from Texas where she received her uh, bachelor's of science in chemical engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. After working in the industry industry for uh, energy industry for five years, she discovered a passion for wine. Um, she is now pursuing her professional science master's in viticulture and enology. Upon completion, she'll be traveling to Burgundy to complete a harvest internship at Domaine Lafayette. Now I'll turn it over to Victoria. Thank you, Ryan. That was really nice. <laughs> um, so like Ryan said, I'm Victoria Chavez and I will be discussing climate indices in viticulture. Oh, there we go. Um, the key themes that I will go over are what is the Winkler index and how was it derived? What impact has the Winkler index had on viticulture? What are the issues with the Winkler index? What are the other climate indices and how do they improve upon the Winkler index? What are the issues with the current climate indices? How will climate change transform grapevine phenology and berry composition? And how will climate change affect wine growing regions? So climate is considered one of the most important elements that affects grapevine performance and wine quality. Climate influences the rate at which grapevines develop, develop and berry composition. The climate therefore limits viticulture to specific regions on earth. Climate indices have been created to determine suitability for the cultivation of grapevines around the world. These indices can dictate the varietal choice, vineyard management, and irrigation practices. To explain why the Winkler Index was created, we need to go back to the late 1800s in California. The number of vineyards was growing and the wine industry began to improve with new cultivars. So the University of California began to allocate funds for viticulture and enology research. However, due to prohibition, research came to a halt for over a decade. After prohibition, Maynard Amarin and Albert Winkler continued the research. Their studies increased the breadth of the experiments to all parts of the state where grapes were grown at the time. From 1935 to 1963, Amarin and Winkler developed what is now known as the Winkler Index. It is a classification system used to differentiate wine growing regions based on the amount of heat received during the growing season. There are five degree day regions ranging from cold to hot. The amount of heat received is calculated as growing degree days with the equation shown here, where T max is the daily maximum temperature, T min is the daily minimum, and 10 degrees Celsius is the threshold for grapevine development after winter dormancy. This threshold is based on one of the first serious studies of viticulture and climate's influence on phenology by Alphonse de Condole in 1855. De Condole noticed that vines did not start actively growing until air temperatures exceeded approximately 10 degrees Celsius. To derive the index, Amarin and Winkler tested 122 different red and white cultivars from all around California. All grapes were transported to Davis for crushing, fermentation, and aging. Once complete, the wines were blind tasted and scored on a 100 point scale. The scoring was based on merits and defects, which originated from the grapes rather than winemaking practices. Here you can see the scores from the red wines. Note that Cabernet Sauvignon scored highest with a 98. They then used the degree day calculation and their scores to demarcate five different regions with recommended varieties. Amarin and Winkler's publications significantly influenced viticulture practices in California early on. It was used as a guide for replanting and planting new vineyards after World War II. 
It also had an important impact on recovering the US wine industry after prohibition. They ranked Cabernet Sauvignon first in the production of red table wines. And now Cabernet is the most highly valued cultivar and the second most planted in the state. They also ranked Chardonnay first in the production of white table wines. And now it is the most planted cultivar in the state according to USDA crush reports. Although the index was derived for the state of California, it has now been used all over the world. However, other regions do not have the same climate as California, such as precipitation amounts and seasons, which greatly affect grapevine performance. Ameren and Winkler hope to improve California's wine industry with their work, but they always meant for their research to be the basis for further evaluation and study. Their work therefore has certain issues to do the, due to the limitations of the time. First, their results are based on viticulture and enology practices that are now substandard. Most of the white wine lots were fermented with seeds and skins, which means more phenolics will be extracted, increasing the astringency and bitterness. However, some of the white wines were pressed immediately, which would have led to inconsistencies in, in the results compared to the other lots. Second, the red musts were pressed when they thought enough color had been extracted rather than testing the wine. This could have led to under or over extraction of certain wine compounds and is very subjective. Amarin and Winkler noted that lots with raisins were pressed earlier to reduce sugar concentration and raisin flavors, which leads to the next issue. Picking should have been done before the fruit had raisined. Allowing the berries to desiccate does not only lead to unwanted flavors, but possible microbial issues as well due to fungal infection. Next, although temperature control was above standard for the time, it was not uniform until 1939. And even after 1939, it was um, only controlled in the room, not in tank. Lastly, the criteria on which the wines were judged was flawed and subjective. Their list of defects could have been due to winemaking practices instead of inherent pro problems with the cultivar. These issues could have led to unsound results, for the suggested cultivars for each region. In addition, they noted that rainfall, wind, fogs, humidity, sun exposure, and time of maturity for individual cultivars all play a role in grapevine growth. Due to limitations at the time, however, temperature was the only variable included. The calculation was slightly improved with other climate indices, but exper experiments that included winemaking to the scale at which Amarin and Winkler performed was never done again. So let's discuss the other climate indices and how they improved upon the Winkler index. First is the Hewlin index. The Hewlin index is one of the most applied indices in uh, European viticulture. The method gives more weight to maximum temperature and includes a correction coefficient for daylight time based on latitude. Uh, it still uses the 10 degrees Celsius threshold for eco dormancy. The latitude coefficient increases with increasing latitude up to 50 degrees, and it takes into account a grapevine's physiological response to light radiation. This index includes five classes of wine growing regions and two classes where viticulture is not suggested for winemaking. Here you can see the classes with suggested cultivars. Next is John Gladstone's Biologically Effective Degree Day Model, or BED. Gladstone's developed this model because plant growth does not respond linearly to temperature changes. BED includes an upper threshold of 19 degrees Celsius to take this into account, along with a lower threshold of 10 degrees Celsius. BED also includes the latitude correction coefficient and a diurnal temperature range adjustment. There are six climate groups for the BED model. Here you can see examples of different wine growing regions that fit into the BED classification system. The last major climate indice that I uh, will discuss is the Multi-Criteria Climatic Classification System, or MCC. It is based on the Hewlin Index, a dryness index, and a cool night index. The study was based on 97 wine growing regions from 29 different countries. The sites were chosen to provide good geographic distribution and diversity of climates. 
The dryness, dryness index is measured using the water potential of the soil index, which indicates the potential water available in the soil relative to the dryness of the region. The cool night index takes into account the mean minimum night temperature during the month when ripening occurs beyond the ripening period. In the Northern hemisphere, that month is September and in the Southern, it is March. This indicates, uh, this index improves the assessment of secondary metabolites such as polyphenols and aroma compounds. The model results in 36 different climate groups. There are other climate indices, but these are the three major ones outside of the Winkler index. Although they do add improvements, there are still inherent issues with how all indices were derived and calculated. First, temperature does not rise and fall linearly throughout the day. Using the maximum and minimum temperatures to calculate the mean has inherent error because the hourly temperature trend usually resembles a skewed sine curve shown by this graph from the University of Missouri. Instead of using just the minimum max and maximum, it would be better to use shorter time intervals to calculate growing degree days. The cool night index of the MCC model and the diurnal temperature range adjustment of bed attempt to include that temperature dip that you see early in the morning period. However, these adjustments might, might not be uh, universally valid in all regions around the world. Next, plant growth does not respond to temperature changes linearly. This is partially due to grapevines closing their stomata in response to heat and drought stress. Temperatures over about 30 degrees Celsius cause the photosynthetic rate to decrease as stomata begin to close. The rate of photosynthesis has been found to peak at around 25 degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius. The bed model attempts to quantify this issue with the 19 degree Celsius upper threshold. However, this seems really low taking into account that peak. A study by Graham McIntyre found that the Winkler index degree day totals varied widely between different sites in California for the same cultivars. This data suggests that the number of degree days needed for the berries to reach 20 degrees bricks was actually greater in warmer regions. These results show that plant growth does not respond to temperature changes linearly. In this same study, it was also noted that vineyards differed in irrigation. Although this does not explain the entire difference, soil moisture and water availability need to be considered. The MCC model includes the dryness index, but it does, not, it does have limitations as um, this is not always available or represented well throughout a region. However, research and technology um, are improving uh, this, the ability to easily measure this variable. Another issue is that physiology and phenology are cultivar dependent, which means that any lower or up, upper threshold for the calculation is variable. The figure shown here displays the timing for phenological phases from 70 different cultivars. As you can see, they're all grouped together, but there is a range in timing depending on variety. Other research has shown that historical usage of weather stations leads to inaccuracy of degree day calculations. Larger degree day demarcations ignore spatial variability and differences in cultivar phenology. This is an issue with the Winkler index, the Hewlin index, and bed. The amount of spatial variability can be significant within the same appellation. You can see that in this figure uh, of the sub AVA in St. Helena, which ranges from about 3,800 to 4,100 degree days in just that sub AVA. Uh, the MCC model represents spatial variability better because it has smaller climate demarcations. Another issue is that the climate uh, classes and degree day limits are not directly comparable between indices. This figure shows the difference between indices, the Winkler index, the Hewlin index, and BED using spatial variation modeling in the Western US. 
The Hewlin Index and BED typically calculate within AVA spatial variation better than the Winkler Index. They also depict greater viticulture suitability throughout Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. However, the Hewlin Index shows that much of the Central Valley in California, where the majority of grapes in California are grown, is too hot for viticulture. The Winkler Index and BED has this region within their upper limit of suitability. An updated model could standardize classification of wine growing regions. The last issue that I will discuss is climate change. The current climate indices do not consider changes in grapevine physiology and phenology due to climate change. Climate change consists of both increasing average temperatures as well as large scale shifts in weather patterns. These large scale shifts include extreme heat events. If greenhouse gas emissions are not seriously decreased, temperatures are expected to increase two to six degrees Celsius over the next century, which means changes to wine growing regions and suitable cultivars. There are three major climatic conditions thought to be necessary for premium wine production. First, heat accumulation to ripen fruit. Second, absence of severe frost damage. And third, absence of long-term heat waves. Although vine growth would still be possible, the quality of the wine will decrease as cultivars become climatically unsuitable and extreme heat waves alter berry composition. Climate change has already proven to have changed grapevine phenology over the last few decades. As you can see here, warming temperatures have shortened growth intervals and caused earlier onset of phenological phases. Climate change will continue to shift phenological phases which affect harvest timing and berry composition. This figure summarizes certain changes in berry composition due to temperatures above 30 degrees Celsius. Titratable acidity, flavanols, amino acids, and anthocyanins all decrease while sugar and therefore the resulting alcohol in the wine increase. This change in berry composition is the result of deviations in grapevine physiology as the vine responds to heat and most likely drought stress, drought stress as well. This physiological change can cause fermentation issues and uh, decrease wine quality. So how will climate change affect wine growing regions and wine production? One study has shown up to an 81% decline in premium wine growing regions in the US by the late 21st century. This study only considered premium wine growing regions, however, so it rejected regions that exceeded a growing season average temperature above 20 degrees Celsius. The study also concluded that extremely hot days over 35 degrees Celsius could completely eliminate certain wine growing regions. In addition, some regions might face challenges such as molds and mildews due to increase in precipitation. Although this study seems drastic in its conclusions, there's no question that climate change will impact wine growing regions, which means current climate indices will become even more outdated due to grapevines phenological and physiological response to warming temperatures, prolonged heat waves and changes in precipitation. In conclusion, it is important to evaluate the benefits and limitations of current climate indices to assess how we can create an improved model to homogenize classification. Especially as climate change and its effect on viticulture become severe, we need to understand how extreme temperatures and changes in climate affect grapevine growth. The cultivars planted will most likely have to change it will become possible to grow cultivars typically grown in warmer climates in historically cool regions. And the already warm regions will have to look at heat stress tolerant cultivars. Also new wine growing regions may develop due to changes in climate. The new model needs to include detailed temperature of berries and canopy, cultivar specific growth parameters, accurate data on light intensity and radiation, soil characteristics, water availability, estimates of vine water use, physiological data, and spatial variation analysis. I'd like to thank Dr. Forrestal, Dr. Cantu, my fellow classmates, 
um, the Pearl and Albert J. Winkler Scholarship, uh, Les Dames de Scoffier Sacramento Chapter Scholarship, Women of the Vine and Spirits Educational Scholarship, the Wine Spectator Scholarships, Sacramento Home Winemakers, and the Jastro Shields Stipend. Uh, thank you, Victoria. So now we'd like to open up for any questions. Hi, Victoria. Hi. Thanks for a great presentation. Um, I have a quick question. I have two quick questions. One is, did in the BDD model, it's pretty surprising that they would suggest a 19 degree Celsius threshold. Do you, did they provide any justification for that? Or um, what are I'd your thoughts on why that was chosen? I'd have to look deeper into, into that, but I know it was just based on trial and error. And I know that it was um, created by an Australian guy, um, yeah. which makes it seem even weirder, but. <laughs> cool, and then do you think, I mean, there's McIntyre's work in Australia too, and he's argued that it's not really possible to have a universal model. Do you think that because of all the changes climatically and with fires being playing a role too in suitability um, and smoke impacts. Do you think that it's even possible to have a universal uh, metric that would be valuable? Or do you think it's something that will have to be adapted for different regions and changed slightly? And do you think it's even useful to have a new index at all? Like <laughs> there, are some, there are some people that argue that it might not be, um, especially with so much variation and variability in the future. Yeah, and there's definitely a lot of variation, but I think it would be very useful to derive a new model. Um, and I think it would be useful to start on a small scale um, and then hopefully maybe by, you know, collaborating with different universities or um, you can kind of create more of a universal model. But I, I do realize that that would be um, very difficult, especially with climate change and fires and and everything, all the different aspects. Great. Thanks, Victoria. Thank you.